Terus? Don't you normally do that one? Bless but I thought Shay normally did. Oh my soul. Do I? Oh my soul. You're singing. What? It's usually um, B flat. Did you just transpose that in your head? God, you're so awesome. Dave is awesome. He just transposed B flat capo four to D open. Everybody get that? Tell me what key that is. <laughs> Bless the Lord of my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship your
Well, I can't do no, it. It's like a box of chocolates. No, no, that's not the reference he was making. It's like you get a box of ruffles snow But you never know what you're going to do. We're not tossing it back in. Papa! But we might as well do, Lord, I need you. We've got four.
Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see everybody out tonight. Um, before we get started, I want to let you guys know something very important. Um, tonight, today, is Robin's birthday. Today. So, I'm thinking we should sing happy birthday, right? All right, let's sing. Somebody start us, because I'm not singing in this. We are on lesson five tonight, and of course, we only have six lessons, so we have tonight and next week, and then I want to take a minute and plug Mr. Dickey's financial peace class that will be happening uh, the following Wednesday after we wrap up here, and then of course, the next Wednesday, I'll be in Haiti, and then when we get back, we'll start an additional group. So I encourage you to get plugged into Dickey's group. Uh, if you haven't gone through Dave Ramsey's financial piece, you need to do that. Uh, learn how to manage your finances in a godly way. Uh, the scriptures say a lot about that. So, uh, so you want to get plugged into that. And then once I get back, we'll start a, uh, another adult life group. And this one's called You Ask For It. And so we are taking questions, and if you go to our church Facebook page or our website, you can find a form to fill out, and uh, you can just ask whatever questions you want to ask, whether it's about 
uh, the existence of God, Jesus, the Bible, aliens, dinosaurs, or just whatever else is going on in your mind, ask it. I'm not going to guarantee we'll do a study on it, but, uh, but you can ask it anyway, right? So go ahead and, and fill that out and get that sent in, and then we'll round up several of those, and um, uh, we'll do a one-off lesson on each question, right? Again, you know, we can't do all the questions, but we'll, we'll try to knock, knock out several of them in the process. So, so those things are up and coming, and uh, we're excited about that. All right, let's go ahead and start things off with prayer tonight, and then we'll jump into the art of forgiveness. Dennis, would you care to pray for us tonight? Thank you, sir. Hey, do um, you guys ever learn any Bible songs as a kid? All right, what are some of the songs you learned? All right, the B-I-B-L-E. You got to sing it for us, right? <laughs> yeah, I stand upon the Word of God, right? The B-I-B-L-E. What else did you learn as a kid? Jesus loves me. Any others? This little light of mine, yeah, that's another one. Right? Oh, Zacchaeus, yeah, I forgot about the wee little man. So, <laughs> so Zacchaeus, you know, I, I didn't grow up in church. Um, we were kind of the priesters. We'd go on Christmas and Easter. And I had, a, uh, I had an aunt who, she, she, I just at the time, I mean, she's an awesome lady, and at the time, I just could not understand, you know, why they were always at church. All I know is that I didn't want to go to church on Sunday night because it messed up Ric Flair and wrestling on TV, TBS, right? So, um, but occasionally, Dad would send me off to church with her, and uh, it was particularly at VBS or something like that, and and I remember this song, and why it stuck, I don't know. But it was based on Ephesians 4.32, and, and it went, and I'm just going to say it, I'm not going to sing it, right? Uh, <laughs> but it would be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God forgave you. And then at the end you'd go, Ephesians 4.32. And so, I, for some reason, that just stuck with me as a kid. And I remember that song... Um, even to this day, it still pops into my head, and I'm not, I'm not really sure why, but now that I've grown up some, uh, I really like just the, the meaning of not only Ephesians 4.32, but the whole book of Ephesians. But here's what Ephesians 4.32 says when I'm not singing it. Uh, you know, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And so when we look at this passage, it just almost breaks down naturally for us, and we don't really have to do a lot of uh, examination with it, because here's just what it says, be kind to one another. And so when we think about kindness, we typically think of somebody using their manners, right? Yes, sir, no, sir, holding the door for someone or something of that nature. But in the biblical world, being kind meant something a little bit different than that. It actually meant being useful, right? And it meant specifically meeting someone else's needs in a physical or spiritual sense. Okay, so if you're going to show kindness in the biblical world, then what that would look like is just simply meeting someone else's needs. Uh, the tender-hearted portion of that means to have sympathy on someone else. And really, it talks about the idea of when you cry, I cry, right? When you laugh, I laugh. When you do whatever you do, I do whatever you do. So it's that, it's that capacity to think from somebody else's perspective, okay? And so maybe we'll call that empathy or something like that today. But that's really what the word is, is getting at. It's just being able to hurt when someone else hurts. And then finally, uh, this idea of forgiving one another. 
And this is something you might not have known, and this is a biggie. So if you're, if you're into you know, highlighting or underlining your Bible or just taking notes, get a hold of this because the word for forgiving or forgiveness, it's the same root word as the word grace. And it means to pardon or to rescue someone or something. And so for us to extend grace to someone, really the concept is that we're forgiving that person in the same manner that when God extends grace to us, then we have been pardoned or rescued or something of that nature, right? So it's that same concept, and we say, well, that sounds simple enough, right? I can, I can do all those things. I can, you know, I can be kind. I can, I can meet somebody's needs. You know, I can, I can even be tenderhearted. You know, and maybe I'm a little more comfortable with, with laughing with someone than I am crying with them. But, you know, if need be, I could probably do that too. And, and forgiving another person, you know, I can extend grace. And that sounds good enough, but notice that last portion, right? That's the real stickler. And it's forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. Right, so that's what makes all of this stuff so difficult, right? Those three things are just kind of pie-in-the-sky theology stuff. And we say, well, you know, it sounds easy enough. I can do all that. But it boils down specifically when Jesus says, I want you to do all this stuff in Christ the same way that I did for you. And so here's one of the things that I'm convinced of. A lot of relationships are just hurting and struggling because we've never learned how to forgive people. We've never learned how to forgive specifically the way God forgave us. And so if we're going to understand the concept of forgiveness, if we're going to understand the concept of grace or pardon or rescue or any other name you want to attach to that, we've got to understand how God forgave us, right? We've got to unpack all of that stuff so we can get to the stuff that deals with relationships. So how do we go about forgiving one another, right? What's the art of forgiveness? What does it mean to forgive the way God forgave us? You know, are there characteristics when we talk about God's forgiveness that should show up in ours? But here's, here's the reason why I call this the art of forgiveness as we start to unpack all this. My, my 14-year-old is an artist for sure. And if you go in my office, you'll see a bunch of paintings all over the wall. And it's stuff that she did when she was just tiny. And, you know, the art is just not that good, to be honest with you. But she made them for me, and I love them. And so when she walks in my office, she says, Dad, I wish you would take those down and put up some of my newer stuff. And I said, no, I like the old stuff, right? I like the spelling mistakes, and I like just those, you know, just seeing some progression and how she's matured over the years because it kind of gives me that, that snapshot in time. But here's the one thing I know about art. She's only gotten better because she practices at it, right? So when you go in her room, you know, she, she's got, maybe she'll have her paint set out, and maybe she's doing acrylic this day or watercolor the next. Maybe she's got a pencil and paper out the next day or behind her she's got you know some clay and she's learning to shape stuff and mold things and all this stuff but it's practice right because art requires attention and practice and so here's the thing I've learned about forgiveness if we think we just fall into forgiveness it won't happen right forgiveness is an art and by implication that means it's something we've got to work at because it's not anything that comes natural Right? It's always something that's difficult at best. And for us to learn how to forgive the way God forgave us, then we've got to practice at it and we've got to get into it. So, but let's just be honest for a minute, right? Because we live in a world where forgiveness is tough to practice. And when I say that, you probably already have one person in mind and you say, you are exactly right, right? Because I have a hard time forgiving. Specifically, this one person in my life I have a hard time forgiving. So forgiveness is tough because we live in a world that makes forgiveness difficult. Because here's the thing, not everybody shares your worldview, right? Everybody that you rub up against 
throughout the course of a, of a day or a week or a year for that matter, very few of them probably share your worldview on life or politics or marriage or anything else for that matter. Throw in school shootings and terrorists blowing up things and, and abortion existing in this world and on and on and on. And forgiveness is tough. But then you throw on top of that forgiveness in your relationship and you think, well, you know, it's, that's kind of abstract, you know, forgiveness and talking about those things. But man, what about my dad? He was an alcoholic and he beat the snot out of my mom and me when I was little. Now, my dad didn't. I'm just using that hypothetically, right? Um, and so maybe, maybe that's what you're struggling with when you talk about forgiveness. Or maybe there's unfaithfulness and a lack of trust or a coworker or somebody that you trusted who talked behind your back and you found out about it and you just really have a hard time forgiving that person. Robert Lewis, Robert Lewis Stevenson wrote about these two sisters and as far as uh, as far as I know, this, this was something that really happened that he wrote about. Uh, these two sisters were, you know, they just kind of grew up together and they stayed together. And neither one got married and they just kind of became, you know, spinsters as they got older. And they lived in a house together and they had a big blowout argument. And they literally divided the house in half. I mean, they, they, they put a line right down the middle of everything. This is my side of the couch. This is your side of the couch. This is my side of the refrigerator. This is your side of the refrigerator. And on and on and on. They literally have everything in their life. And they refuse to acknowledge each other's presence. And with a piece of chalk, they marked each other out of their lives completely. Now, here's the thing that I'm convinced of. That people are still drawing chalk lines in life. We may not see it. Right? Maybe it's not as visible as walking through a front door and seeing a line running right down the middle of a house, but listen, we still draw lines. Every time you carelessly speak a word and you hurt someone's feelings, you draw a line. Right? Every single time you do something that offends someone you love or someone you don't love for that matter, you draw a line. You mark people out of your lives. And so something happens, whether it's real or imagined, and the result is this. I don't want anything more to do with you. I'm drawing a line. Now, here's what I want you to see. In the good old 1611 King Jimmy version of Scripture, we, we run across this verse, okay? And we'll look at it in a different translation in a minute. But I really like the way, I like the way this one, uh, this translation works in this particular instance. He says, if your brother trespasses against you. What does it mean to trespass? Okay, but just in a general sense right? No, no morality involved. If I'm trespassing on Gene's property, I'm there because Gene drew a line with a fence or something of that nature, and he puts up a sign and he says, don't come across this boundary, right? You can be on the other side, but on this side, this is me. And so you're not allowed to trespass that. And so in scripture, that kind of works the same way, right? And when we talk about trespassing, so this is what Jesus is getting at here when he says, if your brother trespasses against you, in other words, when somebody draws a line and you infringe upon that line, when you've, when you've come across this territory, then you've gone too far. And so Jesus says his followers are supposed to act much differently. And we'll, we'll unpack that here in just a minute. But Jesus says, rather than drawing lines, my followers are supposed to erase them, right? And the way we erase lines is through forgiveness, right? We learn how to erase lines because it's the line that causes the trespass, right? And so we, we learn how to erase lines, how to erase those kinds of boundaries that cause bitterness and hostility and those kinds of things. And here's the thing, right? If we don't, then I'm not sure we've really learned what it means to be forgiven by God. So I think it kind of works in that relationship. 
So I want us to unpack this idea of forgiveness. And let me back up here. I'm getting ahead of myself. So I want us to do that. Um, So if you have your Bibles, I want you to look at Matthew 18 with me tonight because I want you to just to see some profound stuff here. And, and what we're talking about tonight, listen, it's not even 100% relational. This is just what it means to practice and learn about forgiveness. Learn about it and then practice it would be a better way to say that. And then we can talk about how it applies to our relationships. But I, I want to talk about just some fundamentals of forgiveness. Now, when you're in verse 15, um, We're going to actually look at verse 21 and following, but here's the way Jesus does this. In verse 15, he he starts talking about when your brother sins against you. And he realizes, I think, that this is a tough thing for us to grab hold of, right? When somebody trespasses and and we we draw that line, we reinforce that line, and we, we chalk them out of our lives, so to speak. I think Jesus realizes that this happens far too often. And so he gives this instruction in verse 15 through 20. And particularly, there are four things that he talks about doing when he talks about when somebody sins against you. And the first one's right here in verse 15. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Right? So here's the first thing Jesus talks about. Just just go and tell him alone, right? doesn't need to be plastered all over the news or anything like that. Just, just go and tell him. And then the second thing is, is following right up, right? He says, if he listens to you, then you've gained a brother. But if he doesn't listen to you, take one or two others along with you so that everything may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. This is straight out of the Old Testament, right? In Deuteronomy 19.15, every judicial kind of charge or matter had to be established by two or three witnesses. And so Jesus says, look, if they won't listen in this manner, then up the ante a little bit, right? Take two or three people with you because this is getting more serious. You've pointed out somebody's um, trespass. They've trespassed against you. You pointed it out. There should have been reconciliation and restoration and all that stuff, but that doesn't always happen. And so he says, so you up the ante with number two. Now he says, and again, if he listens to you, then great. But if he doesn't, then tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen to the church, then let him be as a Gentile and a tax collector, right? So it's first alone, then it's two or three witnesses, then it's take it to, in church, by the way, just means the assembly, right? So take it to the assembly, and if they don't listen, if they don't listen then, then you just, it's okay to go ahead and, and, and remove them from, from fellowship. Treat them as a Gentile or a tax collector. In other words, somebody who's out of covenant with God. And then he says this, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Well, we could unpack that for a long time, but let me, let me just go on before, we, uh, before I side, get sidetracked. He says, Again, I say to you, if two or three of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Now let me just say this, as a, as a pet peeve. Never say where there are two or three people are gathered, we can have a worship service, that God's there in the midst. That's not what this is talking about. I couldn't tell you how many times I've heard people say that. Where well, there's two or three gathered, we can have a worship service. This is about discipline and forgiveness and reconciliation. right? Jesus says where two or three people make a decision to remove somebody from fellowship or something of that nature. He says, that's bound in heaven. Okay, so what he's saying is, I'm there in the midst. So if two or three people make a godly judicial decision about about somebody's unrepentant life, then he says, that has a heavenly meaning to it. Okay, so that's the context of, of what he's getting at. Now, you may be sitting here and your head's swimming, and that's okay because I think the disciples had the same problem because then Peter comes up in verse 21 and he says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? So Peter gets it, right? Peter understands what the Lord's saying. He doesn't like the fallout of it, so he says, well, how many times do we have to go through this forgiveness thing? 
And then notice what, it, then he, he even says, as many as seven times. And I think he's expecting Jesus to say, well done, Peter. You forgive someone seven times? That's, that's remarkable. You must be a very forgiving person. And then the Lord says, no, I don't say seven times, but 77 times, or 70 times seven, which is 77 times, right? They didn't do multiplication. This is not, I mean, they did multiplication, but that's not what this is, right? It's like the old Gettysburg Address when Lincoln says four score and seven years ago. We know that's 87. That's kind of what Jesus is saying here, 70 years and seven, or, or 70 times and seven, so it'd be 77 times. And so this is a tough thing. So then Jesus tells them a parable. And he talks about an unforgiving servant. So here's what I want you to see, right? Jesus talks about the importance of forgiveness and how tough it is and how often we have to do it 77 times. And then he turns right around and he says, now let me tell you guys this story. Uh, it's a story about a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And I'm not going to read this whole story to you, but here's what I want you to see. Um, the king wants to settle accounts with his servants, and, and this one servant's brought in, and he owes him 10,000 talents. And we say, well, you know, what is a, a talent? Well, let's put it in perspective. A, a one talent was equal to about 20 years' worth of day labor. Okay, so this guy owes him... 10,000 talents, and again, each talent is 20 years worth of day labor. Now again, I think Jesus is speaking in metaphoric terms because here's what he does. He, in essence, just gives them the highest number in the whole Roman world, right? That's as, that's as high as they could count. That's the highest number they could go. Right, so that's essentially what Jesus does. So in essence, here's what he's saying. This guy owes the king more than anybody could ever imagine. And so for whatever reason, uh, the king hears the servants, please, and maybe he knows that the debt is so large that there's no way the servant could, could work and pay it off and have it reconciled. Maybe the king realizes that the most important thing is that he has a relationship with with, the, with his subjects. And so for whatever reason, we're not told why, the king makes the decision to forgive the debt. And so certainly the king has the expectation that this newly forgiven servant is going to forgive other people as well. In the same manner that he had been forgiven, he expects him to forgive other people. But that's not what happens because this newly forgiven servant goes right outside the door and he sees someone who owes him a hundred days of common work, a hundred days of day labor. And he demands that it be repaid, and when the guy can't pay it, you know, he begins to abuse him. And so other people find out, and they go back and they tell the king, and the king re-summons the man back into his court, and he throws him into a debtor's prison until his debt can be paid, but we already said that's the highest number in the whole Roman way of numbering things. So there's no way it's, he's ever going to pay it off. So he's in there forever, in prison. And the whole point of it is this, right? He didn't learn to forgive as he had been forgiven. So what's up with that when we do it? Because I'm convinced that in my life and in yours, we've not always learned to forgive others the way God has forgiven us. And here's the thing, again, I'm convinced of. When we fail to forgive others the way God has forgiven us, we're kind of cutting off the branch that we're sitting on, right? And it's a big testimony to God that says they don't understand forgiveness, right? If you can't forgive somebody of something in your life, then you don't understand what God has forgiven in you. And I know you may be saying, look, that's not fair. That's, that's a rough assessment. It is rough. And I'm not saying it's easy, because that's why I preface this lesson as the art of forgiveness, because you're going to try it a hundred times, and it's not going to work, right? You're going to have to come back to it again and again and again and again, because it's difficult. And so here, here's what I think happens in our lives when 
when we fail to forgive, we are not forgiven. Now, this is not necessarily what I think happens. This is, this is straight out of Scripture. Listen, I cross the line all the time. I, I trespass against others all the time. I can be one of the most critical people that you'll ever meet. And I know you may be saying, I didn't under, I don't think so. You're Mr. Nice Guy. Well, I'm not, right? Not always. Sometimes I can be, but not always. I can be, I can be hypercritical. And I have a very sharp wit sometimes too. And I can, I can, if I'm upset and you combine those two and it's kind of the perfect storm, I can say some words that hurt very deeply. I've said some things to Kim that hurt very deeply. And some things to my kids and other people as well. And so I can lose my temper very easily also. I remember one time I was, I was building this, this, uh, this gate and I, I couldn't, I just couldn't get it to frame up right. It was a gate to a porch and I took a hammer out and I'm trying to just get it bent into shape and I hit it a little harder and a little harder and finally I'm just pounding on it until it's destructed and I just throw it over the edge of the porch and I'm done. I'm just forget it. I can lose my cool. And here's the thing, right? When I take that stuff to God, you know what Scripture tells me happens? That when I, when I confess my sins to Him, that He is faithful and just to forgive just like that. But when somebody's critical of me, or when someone loses their cool on me, I can hold a grudge. And I cannot forgive that person. It's easy to harbor those difficult feelings towards someone else. Now see, that's a practical application for what Matthew 18 is talking about, right? They're talking about talents and money, but let's just put it in real terms. If I am overly uh, hypercritical or if I blow my top and I'm angry and I, and I sin against someone else and I do that kind of stuff and I take it to God and He forgives me, but yet the very next person who blows their top on me or critical of me, I'm not going to forgive that person. I'd rather just mark them out of my life and send them on down the road. I've done exactly what this unforgiving servant did in Matthew 18. And the danger of that comes in Matthew chapter 6 because here's what Jesus has to say about it and this is almost the shocking part of what we read because in Matthew chapter 6 in the model prayer Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray they come to him and they say Lord teach us how to pray now maybe they had heard the Lord pray before and they said you know this is kind of an amazing thing and and our prayers sound nothing like Jesus's prayer so maybe we should learn to pray a little more like Jesus and so Jesus begins to pray and here's what he tells him at the end of this prayer after he's walked through our father in heaven and and he said all this stuff he says in verse 12 and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors do you notice anything in particular about verse 12 what tense is that Yeah, it's already happened, right? And that's exa- Amanda's 100% right. Because again, notice, notice how he words that. God, forgive us our debts because we have also forgiven our debtors. So when we approach God in prayer and we need to be forgiven, then we need to have some introspection in our life that says, well, have I forgiven everybody who has offended me? Because if I haven't, Well, the next verse or a few verses down tells us the implication in verse 15. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. Ouch. That's tough. That's why this is the art of forgiveness. Because it's difficult. And nobody ever said it was going to be easy. But how have I forgiven others? Here's the question. How have I forgiven others who have crossed the same line I've crossed? You know, and when I read that story in Matthew 18, am I more like the king or am I more like the unforgiving servant? You know, which one better fits my life? All too often, I think it's the unforgiving servant. So to forgive as God has forgiven is not typically how we look at forgiveness. And we have to ask, well, why did God forgive me? 
Well, the best thing I can come up with is that forgiveness needs to be about reconciliation. Right? God forgave us because he wanted a, a relationship with his creation. And so in his sovereignty, in his wisdom, he worked out forgiveness through the cross of Christ, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He worked out my forgiveness and yours. And so he says because that kind of forgiveness is so available and it's so all-encompassing and it's so amazing, you need to forgive other people in that same way as well. Because when you don't, the implication is you don't really understand forgiveness yourself. So we have to learn how to forgive because, again, reconciliation matters. And that's the end goal of forgiveness. It's reconciliation. It's all about relationships. Now, here's the thing. We like to forgive without reconciliation. And what that is more like is just psychological, right? It's just cutting loose that baggage that's, that's kind of burning you down inside, and you just cut that stuff off, and you say, you know what, I'm just I'm giving that to God. I'm not going to let it bother me anymore, that kind of thing. And, and, we, and we, we process that, but I'm not sure we've really ever forgiven because we haven't really worked on reconciliation. But now let me say this, right? Everybody who, who sins against you or, or trespasses against you, I'm not saying you have to reconcile with everyone, right? If someone has hurt you in a, in a, in a bad physical way uh, or, or in another kind of manipulative way or, or something that endangers you or your well-being, your physical well-being, your spiritual well-being, those kinds of things. I'm not saying you have to reconcile with those people, but here's what I am saying. You still have to practice forgiveness. And if reconciliation is possible, and if it's a healthy thing to do, then we should always try to seek reconciliation. Forgiveness seeks reconciliation. And where that's not possible or healthy to reconcile, then we, we process what it means to let that stuff go. Because here's the problem when we don't. Oh, yeah, there we go. We grow bitter. You ever met a bitter person? What, are, what, what, what does that look like? I mean, if, if, if you, yeah, I see a lot of people, have, when I say, have you met a bitter person, people are shaking their heads. What, what, what's it mean to be bitter? You know, what are some of the characteristics of a bitter person? Cold, okay. Unhappy. What was it? Okay, hard hearts. Okay, difficult to be around. Anyone else? Always negative. I think those are all things that are symptoms of, of bitterness. I want you to see this passage of Scripture with me. It's one that absolutely blows me away. It's in Hebrews chapter 12. And it's one of those that, uh, that when I read, it just it, it leaves me scratching my head because it's one of those that you know, it's simple to see and it's simple to understand, but the implications are just huge. Um, in Hebrews chapter 12, look at verse 14. I think I have that. Yeah. Um, it says, strive for peace with everyone. And so there's that idea of seek reconciliation if it's possible. And for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, that reads weird in the English standard, but it's very true to the original language. Let me, let me read that again. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. The reason that reads weird to me is because holiness has a definite article in front of it. The holiness, right? So the Hebrew writer is not talking about just some abstract concept of holiness, of being, you know, set apart or something of that nature. No, this is the holiness. So there's something specific about this kind of holiness. And so the Hebrew writer says, strive for that, strive for peace and for this kind of holiness because without it, no one will see the Lord. 
So we know immediately we, we need to pay attention, right? Because if, if you have our to-do list out in front of us, somewhere on there somewhere, we want to see the Lord, right? <laughs> you know, uh, so that, that's kind of that's an important thing. Uh, but here are, the Hebrew writer says, well, here are a couple ways to, to avoid that. If that's not on your to-do list, then don't practice peace and, and don't seek out the holiness that God expects. Because if you don't do that, then you're not going to see the Lord. And then here's the part I want you to, to see for tonight's lesson. This is, this is kind of the, the take home from this. He says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Did you catch that? See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. So if you don't want forgiveness in your life, Right? Because you remember I told you that forgiveness and grace come from the same word. Right? So if you don't want forgiveness and grace in your life, what do you need to be? Just be bitter. Right? Because if you want to practice bitterness, then that's what you're going to get. And so see to it then, and the Hebrew writer says, see to it that nobody is bitter, that there's no root of bitterness in anybody's life, and that it springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. So a couple things going on here. That bitterness not only robs us of joy in our relationships, but it also robs us of our relationship with God. And so if you want to be bitter, then you're not going to have, you're not going to have healthy relationships with anybody in this world, nor with with God. Now, here's the thing that I want you to, to keep in mind here, because this, I think, is, uh, is important. If you think about the, the time of the Exodus in Scripture, uh, so we've got, just to, to kind of unpack all this, right, we've got Abraham and his boys, you know, his lineage, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob has a bunch of kids, 12 boys, and they all go down to Egypt because there's a famine. And when they go down to Egypt, they end up being enslaved there by Pharaoh, and they begin to lose their identity. Right? They're held captive. They're in bondage. They're making bricks without straw. They're doing all these kinds of things. And, and the Hebrew language itself spells out that Pharaoh treated them uh, as not even human, right? as subhuman. Uh, and so they're in bondage, and here comes Moses, this, this deliverer figure that God calls. And here comes Moses, and, and he says, Moses, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my firstborn son go. And Moses says, okay, I'll do that, but when I go tell them, they won't even know who you are. Because that's what bondage looks like, right? Right? You've forgotten the covenant name of God. And so they won't even know who you are, Lord. And he says, so who do I say is sending me? And he says, well, you tell them I am who I am. I am that I am. And so Moses does that, and he goes and tells them. And here's the thing, right? The, the Israelites who are in bondage and in slavery, they have to put their trust in God so that they can be delivered from, from the hand of Pharaoh and from the oppression of Pharaoh. And then once they put their trust in God and they're delivered, then Moses says, okay, here's the law, here's what I want you to do, those kinds of things. Right? They weren't delivered because they kept the law, they were delivered because they trusted in God to leave Egypt. And so, so they leave Egypt, and uh, on the 10th plague, the Passover plague, when the death angel comes and, and kills the, the firstborn son of all the Egyptians because Pharaoh held his firstborn son. Now here's what I'm getting at, and long story short, it's probably too late, right? But here's, here's what I'm getting at. Um, every year, even to this day, Jewish people still gather together for Passover, and they gather and they celebrate that event that I just briefly explained to you and did a terrible injustice with it. Right? So they gather together and they celebrate it. And in that celebration, they eat bitter herbs. And the reason they eat bitter herbs is because those, that, those bitter herbs remind them of the time that they were in bondage and in slavery to Pharaoh. 
because that's what bitterness does right that's the effect of bitterness because when you're bitter you're in bondage to it and you're in slavery to it and God sets up this reminder for his children every year you eat those bitter herbs so you remember don't go back to slavery don't go back to bondage move on toward forgiveness and grace and reconciliation and peace but if you want to go back then you won't see the Lord and so the same holds true for us I think as well right if we want to practice bitterness we can do that and we can be bitter and we'll disqualify ourselves from the grace of God and we'll just live in bondage or we can learn how to practice forgiveness and we can move toward a healthy relationship with God and a healthy relationship with the people he's put around us but we have to trust God with those with, with all of our issues and and we have to trust God to vindicate us uh, even though we want to take matters into our own hands because again catch how that process works Moses tell my people that I'm gonna deliver them they don't, do, they don't need to do anything but trust me. And they did. And they put their vindication in the hands of God. And we, we know how that works out, right? They cross the Red Sea on dry ground. And then when Pharaoh and his army are pursuing, God causes the sea to collapse and, and consumes the enemies of, of Israel. So here's what I want you to do tonight. It's about time for the kids to come out so I want to wrap things up but here's here's what I want you to do tonight um, and we haven't done anything like this before so just bear with me what I want you to do is to just close your eyes for a minute and if you're dealing with some unforgiveness in your life um, I want you to, to kind of picture that person that you're struggling with And I want you to kind of process what it would look like for you to take that next step toward reconciliation. That next step toward forgiveness. And just cutting loose that bitterness that's keeping you in bondage. I want you just to kind of process that for a minute. And I'm going to quit talking and we'll be silent for a few seconds. And then I want to pray for you. And then we'll dismiss. Father, forgiveness is an art that I have not mastered in my life. And I know there's probably some sitting out here tonight who struggle with it as well. It's so easy to run to you for forgiveness when we need it, and grace and love and acceptance when we need it. And we rely heavily on those promises of forgiveness and and our sins being removed from the east to the west. And we're grateful for those promises. But as we study Scripture and we study what our Lord prayed in, in the Gospels, we know that that kind of forgiveness is contingent upon our willingness to forgive others. And while we might not understand that, I think it's just as simple as when we can't forgive other people, we just truly don't understand your forgiveness of us. And so maybe it's not really contingent upon that, but maybe it's just a sign that we're just confused. And so in our lives and our hearts, if we're harboring unforgiveness and yet we're calling out to you for forgiveness, point out those blind spots to us. And may your spirit convict us and draw us to you. May we seek reconciliation with you and with others in our lives and in our relationships with, with people that we do life with. And so, Father, lead us to freshness and, and change in our lives and help us to take those boundaries um, that we have up and, and people trespass against those boundaries. Help us to be people who erase those, those distinctions that we're people of love and acceptance, 
not that we're somebody's doormat that's certainly not what we need to be but help us to be people who seek out um, peace and reconciliation with others and with you so I thank you for this group I thank you for their relationships I thank you for what they um, have meant uh, to our class and and um, I pray your blessings on them and, and I pray you give them what they need for whatever person they're thinking of in their mind tonight to move forward with forgiveness we love you and we thank you in Christ's name amen thank you all